In this video, we're going to learn how to solve circular motion problems. We're going to go through the basics and learn how to do it step by step, and then we'll go through one example problem that is relatively basic. All right, before we get started, we need to go over a couple of things that you should already know at this point. In our classes, we have already covered the following things. More specifically, there are three requirements for any object in order to go in a circle. Those requirements include that there needs to be a velocity that is tangential to the circle. Uh, another way you can think about it is that it can be perpendicular to the radius. Another thing is that, is that it needs to be accelerating towards the center of that circle. If it's accelerating towards the center of the circle, that also means that there's a net force towards the center of the circle. We call this centripetal acceleration. Last thing is quantitatively, there needs to be a centripetal acceleration that equals V squared over R. So this is mathematically how these variables relate together. This is how they write it on the AP test. Now we can also know that uh, the period is the time to do specifically one circle or one cycle. Uh, and so speed can be written as distance over time or two pi r, which is the circumference or the distance traveled divided by the period or the time to do one cycle. Uh, thus in the IV test, they like to write the equation as a equals v squared over r. And then they say equals all this stuff, which is basically you're taking the speed equation right over here and plugging it in for V squared. And when you simplify, you get this. So they write it on the IB test like this, the AP test like this. All right. So when we solve problems, we're going to go through six steps. These are the same six steps we use when solving any problem. Now, when we solve this, we're going to customize these steps to fit the particular situation of solving circular motion problems. Uh, as we do this, you need to know that basically all circular motion problems are basically force problems. So if you've watched any other videos or learned how to solve force problems before, all these steps are going to seem very, very similar because they are. First step, we want to get context. Uh, you need to read the question and know that it's a circular motion problem. Uh, most importantly on a circular motion problem, you need to identify what really is making it go in a circle. Next, we draw a free body diagram. There are several parts to that, though. Uh, more specifically, if there are, are any diagonal forces, we want to sp split those up by using trigonometry. Uh, we'll want to redraw the free body diagram into a working free body diagram just for ease of solving. And then we'll want to make sure that whatever the forces that we came up with, it does make sense in the sense that there is still a centripetal net force pointing towards the center of the circle. If not, we've either forgotten a force or made up a force that's not really there. Next, after for our free body diagram, we want to list our variables. We want to list the things that we know and the things we want to know. Next, we pick an equation, but for forces specifically, we always use the same equation, which is F net equals MA. Uh, in our case, we always want to also s uh, customize that equation, F net equals MA. We do that in several ways. First of all, we always take the F net and we replace it with an expression that shows the sum of all forces. We'll show some examples of that later. Uh, and then lastly, because it's circular motion, we'll take the A in F net equals MA and replace it with V squared over R because that A has to be centripetal or pointing towards the center. After we pick our equation and we get everything set up, we then plug chug and just solve for whatever we need. And finally, after we get our answer, we need to make sure that the answer makes sense. Uh, there is a, another note here just saying as we do some plugging and chugging, we may have to combine some other equations along the way. Let's take a look at a simplistic problem. Okay, here's a simplistic problem where a 1.5 kilogram rock is on a frictionless horizontal surface and is whirled around on a flat circle. It's being whirled around on a string of 85 centimeters in length and the linear speed of the rock is 1.8 meters per second. The goal is to calculate the tension in the string. In order to do this, uh, we want to start by uh, getting context, reading this question, we can sense that it's really a rope or the tension force that's causing the force to be centripetal. We're going to draw a free body diagram. Um, I could do it in lots of different ways. I can do it like a bird's eye view. So I'm looking down at the horizontal surface and I see the rock is going around and around. I haven't drawn the string, but the string would go over here to the center. Uh, if I do it this way, I only have one force, which is the tension force. Now there are other forces acting on the rock. However, we can't see them all here. Uh, there is a force coming out of the page right here, coming out. I can't show it um, right with the little laser pointer, but it's coming out of the page. And that force would be like the force from the ground pushing upwards, the normal force. 
and there's a force right here going downwards into the page, which would be down towards the ground, which is the force of gravity. But we can't really draw those arrows very well in a bird's eye view. So sometimes the way you draw it or the perspective you draw it uh, can matter. You may choose to draw a bird's eye view sometimes, and sometimes you may choose to draw um, a different view, like a heads-on view. A head-on view would be like as if the rock is going around and around, meaning like it, the rock at this moment is actually coming out of the page, and then it goes around and then goes into the page, and then out and then in. And so in other words, the horizontal surface is this flat line right here that the rock is slipping around, going around and around and around. Where here, because it's a bird's eye view, the whole plane is the surface and it's going around and around. In this case, now I can show things like the normal force, the force of gravity, and the tension if I draw it over here. And so this is probably a better way to do it, the heads-on view, so that way you can show all the forces acting on the object. For, so for this situation, we're going to use the head-on view. Now I do want to point out something else that is a common problem people will do. A lot of the times people will, instead of labeling this force inwards as the tension force, they'll label it as what's called the centripetal force. And so they'll label it F sub C or something like that. The problem with that, and the most important thing you need to know, is that a centripetal force is not an actual type of force. Centripetal force should never be on any free body diagram ever. The centripetal force is a net force pointing towards the center of a circle. So therefore, when you add up all these forces, you will get a net force going inwards. The force that is acting centripetally in this case is the tension. That is our centripetal force. But in different circumstances, we can have different types of forces supplying a force pointing towards the, in, uh, towards the center of the circle. So it's really important that you never label centripetal force as a type of force on your diagram. You label the actual type of force, the thing that's actually causing it to go in a circle. Now that we have a free body diagram, we want to list all the variables that we know and the thing we want to know. Okay, so real fast, here we go. We've got the mass of 1.5 kilograms. We've got a string length, which is our radius of our circle. Note how I've listed it, 0.85 meters. This is in centimeters. Please make sure your units are in basic units. Uh, and so then our linear speed is uh, 1.8 meters per second, which we have listed over here. And we're looking for the tension. All right, now that we've got our free body diagram and we have our variables listed, we're ready to pick an equation and solve. Not so much pick an equation, but really customize equation as there's only one we ever use. We're going to use F net equals MA like always, and we customize this to fit the scenario in this case. So the first way we do it is we customize it by first we replace the A with V squared over R. Next we replace the net force with an, ex uh, an expression that represents the sum of all forces. In this case, normal force and gravity cancel out because they're equal and opposite and it's not accelerating up or down. Therefore, tension is the net force because it's the only force left over. So my equation simplifies from F net equals MA to tension, which is the F net in this case, equals M V squared over R, where V squared over R is your central acceleration. Now at this point, I know my mass, I know my speed, I know my radius, and I can just plug, chug, and solve for tension. How simple is that? So we're going to throw in some numbers, and we get an answer of tension equals 5.72 newtons. The next thing that we want to look at, and I want to do this after each little instructional video on circular motion problems, I'm going to do a series of circular motion problem videos. You're welcome to look at it. They just get progressively harder and harder and go over other common tricks. But at the end of each one, I'm going to ask this question uh, and look at the physics of have versus need. This is really important when you do circular motion problems to understand what's really going on behind the scenes. In essence, all circular motion problems, they're just force problems. F net equals MA, plug, chug, solve, done. You could do that with all circular motion problems. However, some of them, the way the question's asked, can trip up a lot of students. They're not really sure exactly what they're supposed to do. Now, those trickier questions, the way they've been worded or the way they ask the question, all comes down to one thing. And that is, you need to understand, in order to, in order to answer those types of questions, you need to understand that there's a have versus a need when you do circular motion. Let me explain. When we do this equation, F net equals MA, we replace the F net with what forces we have present 
on the free body diagram acting on the rock. On this side, though, we are calculating not what we have, but what we need. Remember, this is a requirement in order to have circular motion. So I can have MA where A becomes V squared over R. So on this side is what we need to go in a circle, while this side is what we have supplying that force inward to go in a circle. If we are actually going in a circle, how much force we have going inwards will equal how much force we need going inwards. There are questions where the way they word it, these two are actually not equal to each other, and it's important to recognize those situations, and that's where it gets hairy. However, this scenario is simplistic enough that that is not the case, and it's very straightforward. So let's take a look at a couple of things just to kind of tweak the situation so we can examine this a little bit more in depth. Let's say that we have uh, the rock that we're spinning around, and we all of a sudden start spinning it faster and faster and faster. As the speed goes up, the radius stays the same, right? It's not like I'm saying I'm lengthening the string or shortening the string. If the speed goes up, the radius stays the same, that means that the centripetal acceleration required for this rock will go up. If that's true, then that in general means I need more force towards the center of the circle. Because what I have pulling me towards the center is a rope, and ropes are reactionary, meaning they will just change their amount according to the situation. When I need more force, the rope just nicely provides more force. Kind of like if you um, hang a ball on the end of the string and the tension will equal the weight of the ball, but if you start pulling down on the ball, the tension is now greater. It just naturally responds and pulls harder, uh, and it will keep on getting harder until that string breaks. So tension being a reactionary force makes it so when I need more, I have more. Similarly, if I have the rock this time slowing down, we now have a different situation where the amount that I need, because the speed is going down, the amount I need goes down, and therefore the rope just eases off and says, ah, I don't need to pull so hard, and so now I have less force. This is a nice situation where the need and the have are pretty much always equal because tension being a reactionary force will change to fit the scenario.